And uh, I'm going to follow a very different uh, uh, approach on uh, what uh, Misha Kapovic has been doing. So it turned out that you can have several point of view on the subject. And for instance, let's give one example. So if you have a surface group, and assume here you actually have a hyperbolic surface, So that's, uh, that's going to be H2, the hyperbolic plane, and that's going to be the boundary at infinity of H2. So, so now you can have two point of view on the boundary at infinity of H2. You can either say that, as Misha is uh, advertising, that if you take an orbit, a generic random uh, sequence, of x naught, a random sequence in, a, in the group, and that converges to a point at infinity. So that's one point of view where you emphasize the, groups, the group itself. But you could also say that this boundary at infinity is actually a, a, the end point of a geodesic. And that's a point of view I will try to emphasize. So, um, you know that for hyperbolic surfaces, there is some kind of a beautiful dictionary between, on one hand, the action of gamma on, the, on its boundary at infinity, and on the other hand, the action of the uh, geodesic flow on the unit tangent bundle. So, I will try to follow the approach emphasizing the role of some geodesic flow. And the reason for that is that it's uh, um, discrete groups is um, hard, but continuous group is are much simpler to deal with. Okay, so I'm going to start with a preliminary about contracting maps. On bundles. So let's start with a very famous theorem that you all know, and I guess you uh, you all uh, appreciate its importance. So I had to check. So it's actually due to Banach, and it's uh, 1922. So if uh, X is a complete, I'm sorry for being French, non-empty metric space, And given, so if F is a, let's say, lambda contracting map, that goes from X to X. So what does lambda contracting map mean? It just means that the distance between F of X on f of y is less on lambda, the distance of x on y with lambda strictly less than 1, then then f as a unique fixed point. It's not. So again, what is a fixed point? So just that the point x naught, so that f of x naught is equal to x naught. So I'm not, I'm not going to give this the proof of that. This is a theorem that you, I don't know when you learned it, but uh, I guess undergrad, second year or something. And you know how important it is in order to prove existence of a, I don't know, implicit function theorem or all this kind of stuff. And in many ways, it's uh, one of the rare uh, um, constructive way of building things in, in mathematics by a fixed point theorem. The first thing, imagine that you have a family, a continuous family F. 
Fm of contracting maps, of lambda contracting maps, so then the conclusion is that the fixed point depends continuously on the parameter. And um, so I'm going to give the proof of my advisor. So the proof of my advisor would be to say, so you have a map which is defined. So whenever a map is defined, it's actually continuous. And the reason for that is, uh, so you have this uh, intuitionism uh, logic in which the only thing that you can actually uh, construct are obviously continuous. So there is no such thing as a general function which is not continuous. And it actually, it's actually a very good argument, and it says that whenever you have a constructive way of building something, so then a, uh, the, the object that you construct is actually uh, continuous. And you, you may want to uh, consider the case of step function. But you think about it, it's not, a, it's not a constructive way to build something. So anyway, so you can just look at the proof and check continuity from that. OK? So exercise. Check that. So let's make a, so that's a vague statement. Let, let's make a precise statement. The precise statement is the following theorem. So let a psi, a map from m cross x to x, which is continuous, so let fm be um, uh, Fm be the map from x to x, which associate to x, Fm of x, which by definition is equal to psi m of x. So assume all m Fm is lambda contracting. So then, so then what? There exists a continuous function, a unique continuous function, g, that goes from m to x, so that uh, psi of g, m, um, psi of m, g of m, is equal to g of m. Okay. Right, so that's a statement with quantifiers. So that's one improvement. So, so an improvement is uh, we now try to improve the regularity. Let's try to improve the regularity. So, um, so imagine that uh, you are in a, in a situation where everything is C1. So let's assume Using the notation here that psi m x r c1. So by that I mean that uh, m and x are c1 manifold, or actually even c1 Banach manifold, whatever generation you may want to have. So so then the conclusion is so what the conclusion is? G is c1. So how do you prove that? It's not very difficult to prove, but you, you will have to use the implicit function theorem this time. So uh, the lambda, lambda contracting condition is 
This implies that the derivative at the fixed point, g of m, of f of m, the norm of that, in the, the soup norm, is going to be less than lambda, and it's going to be, I'm sorry, less than or equal to lambda, which is strictly less than 1. So if you have a contracting map, which is C1, then actually the, you have some information about the norm of the derivative. derivative. So you have to check that. But that implies that implies that 1 minus the gm of f is invertible by, uh, well, for instance, you, you can take the, the um, series 1 plus df plus df squared. Plus. This is going to be uh, well defined because of this uh, lambda contract of this uh, condition, and then this implies that this object is contractible. And the inverse is, I don't really care about the inverse, but is uh, 1 plus, so let's call that a, plus a, plus a, 2, plus a, plus everything, right? So now, now that you have that, then you use the implicit function theorem, which actually uses Banach theorem, to get that C1, to get that G is C1. Okay? Being C1 manifold. Uh, of F M. Right. Do I require lambda to be? Yeah, yeah. No, no. Lambda is a constant. Okay. So. So let's say, so I should go back there. So let's try to improve again the regularity. So the question now, assume that uh, everything is, uh, now assume psi, so m, x, psi, r, c, k, or c infinity, or analytic. OK? So the conclusion again is that G is C K C omega and C infinity and analytic. So how do you prove that? So this is much easier because I, so applying the chain rule to the equation. So what the proof? Applying the chain rule. to the equation um, uh, psi m g m is equal to g of m. So I'm not going to do the details, but you will obtain actually a, you know, when you have the implicit function theorem, you actually have an equation. Um, that uh, tells you what, if it exists, is g dg. So we have some sum equation, sum function f, so that the derivative at m of g is a function of uh, m, psi, and g itself. Well, that's, a, that's some algebraic Relation. So, that's a, so it, could, it could be the derivative of C. I think it's going to involve the derivative of Psi. So you have this kind of equation. So let's, let's say, imagine, for instance, that everything is C infinity here. So all this F, so imagine everything 
is c infinity. So then f is c infinity. And this means that you can apply some boots, bootstrap. And then you can apply some bootstrap. So that's the part where I'm doing analysis, because uh, I work under uh, severe uh, orders. I'm supposed to do analysis, right? So, so then you have bootstrap. So I, I, at one point I had to look at in a, in a dictionary what really bootstrapping was meaning. So you have you are, you, are, you have boots and you want to lace your boots, right? So imagine that you so you already know that G is C one, right? So this means that this whole term is C one. So it means that the derivative of G is C one. So it means G is C two. So but now if G is C two. All this thing is C2, so this means that G is C3. Okay, so you can obtain a bootstrap this way. So once you have to obtain C1, then an easy bootstrapping produces you everything from the chain rule. Okay? So the, so the bootstrap is you saw that G is CK, so this implies that F M Psi G is ck, and then this implies that g is ck plus 1, right? Okay? So you have this uh, bootstrapping. Okay, so that's uh, uh, what I wanted to say about contracting maps, and I'm going to apply that to a more dynamical situation. So I don't want to... Uh, so now I want to make this into another type of family, which is a going by a two bundle actions. So let's let's start with a let's start with a um, a some definition. So uh, let X be a so where is that my terminology, my notation? No, let M be a... So I'm going to be only interested in the case of compact metric space. So a Lipschitz bundle over M, over M, so is, as usual, so you have a projection from some space N to M, so that's going to be the fiber map, that's going to be the total space of the bundle, And uh, that's going to be a that's going to be the base of the bundle. And uh, so also N of M, which is equal to by definition pi minus one of M is a fiber. So what is the condition of this kind of object being a being a, a Lipschitz bundle? Just that it admits. So um, um, uh, which admits local a trivialization, local Lipschitz trivialization. So this means that for every x in M, 
There exists some U, a neighborhood of uh, of X. So that if I take pi, so I have U of my projection pi, I have pi minus one of U, and and then you have a no, that's the identity, that's u. And here I have u cos x. And I have this local trivialization psi of u, so that, uh, so, that so, so that this commutes, of course, so that the, the diagram commutes. Commutes. Psi of u are Lipschitz, so that's where you want to use the, you want to say it's a Lipschitz bundle, plus of course some conditions for uh, compatibility conditions for trivialization. So I guess you all know what is a vector bundle. So it's basically the same structure, same idea, except that here, the trivialization you assume that they are Lipschitz. Okay. So uh, so what is a section of a bundle now? What? Is there is an X? Oh, X is supposed to be. Uh, so in the end, X is, to, is, is, is going to be Lipschitz to every fiber. So it's, uh, it's, uh, you should say that you have a Lipschitz bundle over M, uh, how do you say, with fiber X? Okay. X is also a metric space. What? Oh, right, the metric on U cross X. Let's say, take the, um, um, let's take the soup metric, right? Uh, here, that's a good question, right? So this is a soup metric. Okay, so now what is a, so what is a bundle map? Okay, so, so let now phi, Oh, I forget some defi another definition. So a section of uh, the bundle is a map sigma that goes from M uh, to N so that I compose with so that for all m, sigma of m belongs to the fiber. Okay? Or equivalently, that pi composed with sigma is equal to the identity, whichever you prefer. And um, so now, so let now phi be a, let's say, homeomorphism. From um, uh, M to uh, M to itself, so M is a base. That's right. Yes. So a bundle map phi over phi is. A, a map phi from M to M so that if U belongs to the uh, fiber at a point M, then phi of U 
belongs to the fiber at phi of m. So in other words, so we have the diagram, so I have m, phi, m, phi, n, big phi, n. So this diagram commutes. So let's give one example of a bundle map. So example of a bundle map of a phi. Well, this is the, an example I'm going to use a lot. So example. So let E over M be a, a vector bundle equipped with a connection. Okay. In the end, the connection is going to be flat, but I don't really care about that. So let phi t be a a flow acting on M. So in this situation, imagine everything is a manifold, right? So, so then the result is that, the example is that, and you have phi t, your flow, okay? And here you have the five vector bundle here. And I take a vector u in the I take a vector u in the fiber here. And I want to obtain some i phi t of u, phi t of u, which belongs to the fiber phi t of m. Okay, so that would be m. And u here belongs to E of M. So there is a very nice candidate, which is, so let's take for phi t, take phi t of u to be the parallel transport of u on uh, along the orbit of phi t, or the flow phi t, okay? So in other words, so given a flow phi t, so given a flow phi t, acting on M, a connection nabla on E over M. So then you can produce, so I guess fiber is going to be like connection, it's going to be randomly uh, a random autograph, right? So you can produce a flow phi t acting on n, okay, acting on e, I'm sorry, over the flow phi t, which means that individually big phi t is over small phi t, okay, so that t gives phi t of u is parallel above the path t phi t of m. It's a phi of u. So that's a very natural way to produce bundle maps. So out of connections, 
And in our situation, we will build bundle maps out of representations, which give rise to flat connection. So um, I'm a bit ahead of myself here. So uh, and uh, so I give an example of bundle maps. So what's the theorem I want to? Uh, what the situation do I want to study? This is a case of bundle. So what is a bundle contracting map? A bundle contracting map. Let's say. That's another definition. So a bundle map phi over f is contracting if So you would like to say that the each of the so a bundle map you can see as a map sending a fiber to some other fiber. So you may want to ask this to be contracting, but this is a bit too much. Okay, so instead I'm I'm, a, I'm a, a giving a weaker condition that if uh, there exists some and not which is a some integer, so that if x, y belongs to the fiber at some point m, then the distance between phi to the n0 of x, phi to the n0 of y, is less than one half the distance between x and y. So, so instead of imposing that I'm fiberwise contracting, I'm saying that there exists some power, so then that I'm contracting. Okay. So um, one, one half is just the name for any constant which is less than one. So a, what is a theorem? So uh, I don't really know whose theorem is that. I guess it's, uh, there is some generalization of that which are more important, which I'm going to explain later, is that if uh, uh, phi over f phi is a bundle contracting map, then uh, F phi admits, or let's say if phi, um, okay, um, I screwed up. Okay, so let's, uh, so um, let, let's go to the, And with okay, so but in the end, I'm going to take powers to make life easier. So, but so for this stage, let's let's assume I just have this this condition, right? So just fiber was contracting. Is that clear? I'm sorry for the yeah. Uh, and phi admits a unique a. Invariant section. Sigma. So this invariant section is going to play exactly the role of a, a fixed point, that is, phi 
So which means phi at the point so sigma at the point phi of m is equal to phi at the point equal to phi of m. Oh, sigma of m, sorry. Okay, so that's the result. So there is a, an interpretation of, of uh, what this means. So and let's, uh, and the interpretation will immediately give you the proof. So the interpretation is the following. So let gamma zero be the space of, let's say, continuous sections equipped with the distance, so which is the infinity of two sections sigma on eta, which is going to be the supremum over x in x of the distance of sigma x eta of x. So then we know that gamma zero is a complete metric space. That's uniform complete metric space. That's a classical result. And then you have an action phi itself acts on the space of section. So you have you have the map phi star of sigma, which is a section which associate to a point M. So you take phi of sigma of phi minus one of n. So, so given sigma, so phi star now is a map from gamma zero to gamma zero, which is contracting. And, and then what? Yeah, I'm so, I always, uh, X, X, M, 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 M. M is, is supposed to be compact, sorry. Is a base. Yeah, I'm so assuming M is, is compact for that. So then this map phi star is a, actually contracting, so it has a fixed point as a fixed point, and a fixed point is exactly equal to an invariant section. <coughs> so the theorem that we had before was the case of uh, uh, m being a point and you have a self-map of the fiber, and the section is just a point in the fiber. So here you have this section, which is this continuous section, which is invariant by your action, and it's actually unique. Okay, so now let's see if you are a awake. And uh, I want to make that with parameters. So I'm going to use democracy for that. So uh, assume so I start with a question. So assume now that, so let's try to improve regularity. Improving regularity. So assume everything is C1, M, N, uh, Phi F R C one. So uh, so now the question is uh, so there is two answer. So the question is is sigma C one. So uh, 
Who is not voting? Okay, so everybody is voting, right? You just agreed to that. So who thinks the answer is uh, no? <laughs> who said the answer is yes? Come on, and the other will agree to vote, right? Do you go to jail in this country for not voting? No? In France, you don't. Okay, so I tried to trick you, which is part of the democracy, right? So, uh, is this really registered? So, a uh, um, recorded. So, uh, actually, no. In general, no. What? Question mark. <laughs> so the answer is no. And, and seriously, this has surprised me for... I am still very surprised by that, but that's a fact of life. So you have all this stuff that I would just see one, C infinity, whatever, and you can't get better, we can get slightly better, but we can't really get higher regularity than, uh, than something. Uh, yes, uh, for you. So, uh, for instance, if it were true, this would mean that the conjugacy between a, uh, a the quasi-symmetric map corresponding to uh, two different function representations is uh, C1, and it's not. So another fact is, uh, so, so, so you, you, you know that you have this, say, if you have a negatively curved surface, and you have this, uh, you, 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 you have this uh, anosov distribution, you have the contracting bundle on the, you, you call it the orospherical foliation for a negatively, for a negatively curved surface. Non-positively curved, sorry, non-positively curved surface. So this, anos, this is the foliation there are C0, and there is a theorem that by GIS, by GIS that say that whenever there are C2, then actually, so in this case, they are C1, but they are actually not, then actually you have a hyperbolic surface. So you have the so-called a um, um, irregularity rigidity in dynamical system that whenever you impose something like C infinity, you, you end up with some nice algebraic examples. So it means that in this context, the whole, whole spherical distribution, they are not C2, and and this all spherical distribution are, are produced at fixed point of some bundle contracting map, which is very nice. Okay. So, um, so that's an important fact of uh, of life, and if I, if you just remember that, I think I, I would be happy. But still, we have a better. We still have a. We still have some result. And. Uh, Okay, so uh, I should say that in special case, yes. So what would be the special case? It's exactly the parameter case that we had before. That is, if phi is equal to the identity, so a bundle map is a family of contracting mapping in the previous sense. So, in special cases, if you have above, uh, above the identity map, then actually this, uh, this uh, everything, so the parameter case of the contracting map tells you that it's actually C1 or whatever. Okay, so, but now you can improve the regularity. And I'm going to do something which I, um, I'm totally afraid of, which is a proof. No, no. Even if it is analytic, whatever. No. But there is a nice result, and you can get something which is better than continuous.
So what is a, this better regularity that you have? This is a holder regularity. So let's say, let's give some definitions. So uh, a map G from a Y to Z, so these are metric spaces, is Hölder, is alpha Hölder, if there exists some constant m, so that the distance uh, between um, uh, g of x and g of y is less than m, the distance of x, y, to alpha, to the power alpha. So, in general, alpha is less than 1. So, that's what is a Hölder map. So, Hölder map has, are pretty good. Uh, some are almost as, as good as Lipschitz map in the sense that you have a, you have a modulus of continuity. So, you have, a, for instance, you have a family of Hölder map for the same constant m. Then they are recontinuous. So they are somehow as good as Lipschitz map for, for that matter. So it's very good to have a, to have a Lipschitz map. So, a, so now what is the result? So theorem. So I learned it into. Uh, the famous book by Hirsch, Pugh, and Schub. But uh, I do not know, I don't know if there is any attribution to that. I'm pretty sure I know who that, I mean, I don't know who proved that. Uh, okay, so. So again, we're in the situation that, so assume that, so let phi be a bundle map, a contracting bundle, let's say lambda, contracting bundle map over, uh, over f. So assume phi is Lipschitz. I don't care about the Lipschitz constant, but I still I still want it to be Lipschitz. Assume phi minus one is Lipschitz with constant k, so I just assume something about the inverse map, and then assume that, uh, right, so now let alpha, so it's pretty explicit, so let alpha, so that lambda k to the alpha uh, less than 1. Uh, I should have said that, of course, here I want alpha to be greater than zero, right? I don't want alpha to be zero. I mean, no. So, a, so let's some alpha which satisfies this condition, right? So there always, always exists some alpha so that satisfies this condition just because lambda is less than one, so there is some power of k so that this is less than one. So then the conclusion that n sigma is alpha holder. And this theorem is why lots of things in dynamical and even in geometry group theory are holder rather than being other regularity. For instance, the conjugation between, mm, between quasi-symmetric quasi maps and stuff like that. So how does the proof goes? So for any 
section sigma, so which belongs to the space of continuous sections. So let V, so what's my notation? V alpha of sigma, which is a uh, limb sub when uh, the distance of xy goes to zero of what you imagine you want to do, which is the distance between sigma of x, sigma of y, divided by dxy to the power alpha. I consider this number. Okay? It could be infinite. I don't really care. But it's, it's a number. Okay, so now let gamma h of alpha in the space of sections, space of sigma, so that this quantity v alpha of sigma is less than h. So you are going to prove several things as an exercise when you come back home tonight. So instead of uh, having fun, so you're supposed to work. So the first exercise is to prove that gamma h alpha is not empty. That's not very hard. Choose the fact that you actually have local Lipschitz trivialization. Second thing is to prove that gamma h alpha is closed in uh, gamma zero. So actually, in here's few on, on Shub that just say that they just say that this is obvious. So I just believe them. I didn't check, but it should be true. H is a positive number. Thank you. And um, and then the other property that if sigma belongs to gamma h of alpha. And sigma is holder. So this exercise I did, and um, it's not very hard. So we have to use the fact that uh, n, what's the name of my base m, is compact. Right. Use compactness to say that if you have such a sigma, then actually not only you have that, but you have that on some small neighborhood. And then you extend, and uh, and then you get that for you. You get the you get the fact that you're holder, okay? And of course, you know what you want to do now is it remains to prove that to prove that phi star uh, phi star sends gamma h alpha to itself. Right? Because if you have proven that, and you know that a fixed point of, uh, of phi stars, you have a fixed point of phi star around that, so, so then this fixed point is actually the fixed point of phi, and this fixed point is holder. So that's what you want to prove. And that's is not very hard to prove, and we shall prove it. So let's first consider the easy case. Consider the easy case. Uh, whenever you have a trivial bundle, so n is equal to x cross n. So in that case, you can see that, uh, uh, so you have this map phi now, you have my, fap, map phi, which is from uh, x to x uh, cross m to uh, x cross m. 
But actually, this map is of the form to the point xm. So you associate, you associate what? You, you know you are going to be above phi of m. And here you have something which I want to call psi of mx. OK? And actually, I want to call that psi m of x. OK, so that's your, your map can be described by that. And a section sigma, and sigma belonging to gamma 0, is just a map f from m to x. Okay. So let's first make some computation and try to understand, get, try to get some grip of, so, So assume f and sigma uh, are a uh, belongs to, which is the same thing, right? Belongs to a uh, gamma of h alpha. And I want to evaluate the quantity, which is d uh, phi of sigma of x, phi of sigma of y. I want to evaluate this quantity. And so you just write what it is, and it's going to be the supremum of uh, uh, the distance between phi of x, phi of y. So of course, I've screwed up the uh, name of the, of the constants. x and y are actually base point, right? And here are the distance between f x of f x um, f y of f y. And I want to control that in terms of d of x y in some way. That's my goal, right? So uh, let's consider this term. Because this term is easily to deal with because f itself is, uh, uh, phi itself is also a, a Lipschitz. So this term is controlled by something which depends on, the, on the, the distance between x and y. Okay. So a, x of on y. So this is a distance, let's say, rewrite what it is, distance between x, fx, psi y, fy. And I'm going to use a triangular inequality to say that it is less than the distance between fx, f of x, psi x, f of y, plus the distance between psi x, f of y, psi y, f of y. OK? So now I can treat each of these terms somehow independently. So what can we know about this term? What do we know about this term? So here, this quantity is just less than lambda d of x, y, where lambda is the Lipschitz constant of big phi. This is because you have f of y here, so f now, this is just a constant, so the regularity of f doesn't count here, so the only thing that counts is uh, the, what you can say about psi. So psi is Lipschitz uh, of phi, or its new name, psi. OK, so this quantity, this one is less than d of x, y. OK, so what can we say now about the other guy? So, so I'm going to cheat a little bit, but it is relatively harmless, which is to, instead of saying that f 
as this uh, V alpha of S less than H. I'm just going to say that F itself is like, uh, um, so here, uh, cheat. So assume that the distance between Fx, Fy, is less than H D of Xy to the power alpha. This is not our assumption. The assumption is that this is true whenever x, y go, the distance between x, y goes to zero. But essentially, since we are going to make the distance between x, y goes to zero, we can as well assume that to make the life simpler. So now this quantity, this is just going to be less than... Oh, okay. So, but now I, use, I have to use the contraction here, property. So this is because less than lambda because psi x is lambda contracting. The distance between f of x, f of y, so using this uh, cheats is going to be lambda h d of x, y to the power alpha. Right? So in the end, my so we say that x, y is less than, than what? Than lambda d of x, y plus lambda uh, h d of x, y to the power alpha. And If you continue this kind of stuff, you obtain that the distance between phi of sigma of x, phi of sigma of y, this is going to be less than some constant we don't really care about, d of x, y, plus lambda h d of x, y to the alpha. Is that clear? Not really, it's not really clear. But it's not, okay. You should give this to students to check. So, right, I'm, I'm just, so I want to evaluate the distance between, so I've, I've uh, Let's not uh, uh, drone myself. So I'm just using here the triangle inequality, and I just want to uh, evaluate this quantity, and I use the definition and triangular equality and my hypothesis in a, a nice and tricky way to get that we have this kind of inequalities. So what we really want to do now is to evaluate the distance between phi star sigma of x So what we want to do is to evaluate the distance between phi star, I'm sorry, phi star sigma of x, phi star sigma of y, right? But this is exactly, by definition, the distance between phi sigma phi minus 1 of x, phi sigma phi minus 1 of y. So according to what we just see, this is less than, than uh, so now you have lambda h k to the alpha d of x, y. So this is because phi minus 1 is Lipschitz. Plus some constants which I don't really care about, let's call it lambda 2, d of x, y. I just plug in my phi minus 1. It's going, just going to change the constant here by some, in some way which I don't really care about. And here you have a k to the alpha. And here I have a d to the alpha here. But now you are in a very good situation because if you divide all that by d to the x to the alpha,
which you divide. So d of phi star sigma of x phi star of sigma of y divided by d of x, y to the alpha. So this is less than, than what? Than lambda h k to the alpha, lambda k to the alpha h, OK? Plus d to the x, y, 1 minus alpha. So we're in very good shape because now this quantity goes to 0. And this guy is less than 1. So this implies that phi star sigma belongs in to v to this uh, space, which I call gamma h alpha. So it's not a very hard proof. It's still embarrassing that on this board there is no word. So a right. So that that was the situation when you had a trivial bundle, but now you can go to uh, any kind of bundle. So so now for a general bundle. The previous, the previous computation were essentially local, which means, uh, right, they're essentially local when x, y goes to z. So you can use trivialization. So you can use. So I'm not giving the details here, but um, anytime you apply some Lipschitz math to the situation, it doesn't change much, much the kind of uh, stuff you get. Right? So now we have this uh, uh, very nice result. which you are going to use, which is the fact that if you have a, so let's try to summarize where we are. So imagine we have this uh, Lipschitz bundle N over M, Lipschitz bundle. bundle. Then you have a map phi, which, which uh, is a contracting map. Bundle map over F map. And then you can produce a unique phi invariant section. And we won't, don't want to continue the theory of uh, Lipschitz bundle in the full generality, so we want to apply this to a very specific question, situation, which what, what I'm going to do next time. So what be n? So I talk about vector bundle, but invariant sections of vector bundles are not so interesting. So I'm going to be interested in the case where n is actually a, so a, the Grassmannian bundle bundle. Let's just say the projective bundle, or let's say projective bundle. Actually, I'm going to just use projective bundle in my in my setting of a vector bundle. Equipped to the connection. So now the idea of an of representation is that instead of 
saying something about the group? You would like prefer to say something about what is the what high sort of hypothesis you have on the action on the Grassmannian bundle that come from a situation. So you start with the representation, you have a flat connection on some vector bundle, so you have the Grassmannian bundle over that, and you want to say some property that you have a contracting bundle the maps and so on. That's going to be the definition of an annals of representation. I'm going to explain that next time, and then I'm going to explain, give examples, and uh, explain some stuff about that. <laughs>